welcome to the History of Philosophy in China by Peter Adamson and Karen Lai, brought to you with the support of the Philosophy Department at King's College London and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, We're a Pack Animal, Individual and Society in Confucianism. Kong Tzu once said, if having reached the age of 40, you still find yourself despised by others, you will remain despised until the end of your days. As so often in the Analects, aphoristic comments may come across as disconcerting or as problematic or as enlightening. Perhaps there is a ring of truth if Kang Tzu meant that we get quite set in our ways by the time we reach 40. The exact age doesn't matter so much. He could have said 40 or 50 or 60. The message is troubling as it concerns how a person is perceived by others. Should we be so worried about how others see us? Yes and no, according to Kong Tzu. It is, of course, important how others view us because they might have reason for believing certain things about us. I might believe I'm a helpful problem solver, whereas others see me as meddlesome. We want to come across well to others, in a range of contexts and in our different roles. On the other hand, we also want to avoid living a life that seeks merely to be crowd-pleasing. Confucian thinkers say this and more about what it means to be a person living in society and contributing to the well-being of others. Kong Tzu is presented as someone who has elitist views about morality. When he was asked what he thought about a person who is liked by everyone in the village, Kong Tzu says he is not so sure. And when asked about a person whom all dislike, he says the same. From Kong Tzu's point of view, it would say more about the widely admired person if those in the village who are good like him and those who are not good hate him. Kong Tzu makes a few points here. First, we do not trust the opinions of everyone. We might take a lesson here for our contemporary setting regarding the weight we give to likes and dislikes on social media. Second, we should stand firm on our own principles rather than follow the crowd. Third, a person's moral life is a, or even the, core aspect of their personhood. This is why the views of those who are good matter. We may wonder why Kong Tzu is portrayed here as expressing some detachment from the judgment of the villagers. Perhaps the early Confucians believed that, in general, people who lived in villages, given their vocations, were not capable of grasping what is valuable in life. Their primary concerns were day-to-day -day practicalities, and they would have neither the leisure nor the resources to consider how people could be inspired to become virtuous. But there are also wider implications. In another comment, Kong Tzu says that the village worthy is the thief of virtue. Kong Tzu's statement here is not simply about villagers leading rustic and prosaic lives. We've discussed the village worthy in an earlier episode and seen how he represents a counterfeit model of virtue. The severity of his judgment is based on the impact such people have on the community as they pass off themselves as valid models of moral life. They are thieves, as from society's point of view, they take from the people a correct understanding of what it means to lead a virtuous life. Of course, you don't need to be a Confucian philosopher to hold the thief of virtue in contempt. So we should further consider how this is a problem specifically for Kong Tzu and his followers. The Confucian conception of humanity understands persons primarily as social beings situated within their communities. There is no viable conception of personhood detached from other persons, and according to which we may theorize about what a person's abilities and achievements should be. Each person is entangled with others and bears obligations and responsibilities within their context of interaction. A person, embedded in society, is where Confucian philosophy begins thinking about personhood, and it matters where we begin. Consider, for example, how we might begin with ableist assumptions about humanity, that humans ought to be able to do certain things, like walk or see. On this view, people in wheelchairs or blind people are not normal and are lesser persons. Conversely, consider taking neurodivergence as a starting point. This starting point is much less likely to exclude those who do not meet standard expectations of normalcy in brain function. If we begin as the Confucians do, with each individual as a person embedded in their lived context, we may see an individual as an administrator at work, a daughter in relation to her parents, a confidant for her closest friends, a volunteer at her community garden on weekends, and so on. We think about people, their relationships, their achievements, and their shortcomings in these settings, rather than as autonomous individuals. These roles that a person has make them who they are, as a role ethicist would suggest, and we've seen in the last episode how a person's roles are the person. This does not mean that if we were to take a person's roles away, the person would no longer exist. A person stranded on a desert island is still a person. 
Rather, in the Confucian sense, roles are not something we can take on and off as we wish. For example, we might encounter this at work when a colleague who holds different roles says, okay, I'll take off my administrator hat and put on my well-being coordinator hat. Statements like this assume that we can straightforwardly move from one role to another, and in some cases, we can. But in Confucian role ethics, a daughter is always a daughter, even when she is interacting with her partner in life or with her children. We may shape our roles to greater or lesser extents, but at the same time, we are the living embodiment of our roles. Whether we advocate Confucian role ethics or not, most of us would agree that a person's interactions with others within the scope of their roles or relationships say much about who they are. For example, how does a person speak with someone who waits on them at a cafe? What is their demeanor in relation to the person in front of them who is struggling to get on a train at rush hour? The way we carry ourselves in such interactions is part of our personhood. Think about how often it is that we like or dislike people on the basis of how they have done something rather than what they have done. Philosopher Amy Olberding asks us to consider the tone of voice used when telling someone, I apologize. Do we say it belligerently, reluctantly, or in a way that is bereft of gestures of contrition? In these ways of apologizing, Olberding says, the fact that I apologize matters little. For her, the Confucian concern, which is the one we should share, is not merely to do right by others, but to cultivate flourishing relations with them. She thus speaks of the style of our actions, expressing the way we carry ourselves. Consider then the style of the sage king Shun. As we saw, in spite of his most dreadful parents, he was interested in forging flourishing relations and remaining filial. Another example would be Analects 1542, where Kong Tzu welcomes a blind musician, gently warning him about the steps into the house and introducing everyone present. As the translator Slingerland comments, Kong Tzu here puts aside the normal ritual behavior of a host in order to deftly and respectfully serve as a guide for the blind music master without being overly fussy or condescending. The reverse case is the thief of virtue, who was keen only to appear to be righteous. We can hardly imagine that his style, if we can even call it that, embodies virtue. In Confucian philosophy, there are two closely related facets of a person's relationships with others. At a personal level, say in the relationship between Shun and his father, Shun's filial devotion ultimately transformed his father's morality. In this way, Shun has effected moral change both in his father and in their relationship. Secondly, from the perspective of a community, how a person carries themselves in their interactions with others can influence the moral life of that community. The Meng Tzu tells us that when Shun's father was positively influenced by Shun's filiality, in turn all fathers and sons came to be transformed as well. This is somewhat far-fetched, but it is an expression of the Confucian vision of the power of moral influence. We can likewise expect that negative moral influences will undermine moral progress in a community. Olberding focuses on this issue to bring out how important style is, and how it works both ways, in relation to moral virtue and vice. She says, My appearing less than virtuous may encourage others to be less than virtuous, or, more subtly, may reduce the pressure in the community to be virtuous. Here we might think of the way that one bad apple in a group of kids at school can encourage bad behavior by mouthing off to teachers, or even just adopting an insolent posture. For the Confucians, personal identity rests on how a person orients herself in the context in which she interacts with others, and how she contributes to and benefits from those interactions. In these contexts, she has a range of responsibilities and varying levels of interdependencies with others. The key question for personhood, then, concerns how a person lives out their humanity. Given this conception of personhood, it should now be a little clearer why ritual propriety, or li, has a central place in Confucian philosophy. By acquiring li, people acquaint themselves with practices that enable human interactions. This is how we familiarize ourselves with a community's practices of acknowledging other people so that we can participate more fully in our interactions with them. A nod and a smile for an acquaintance or looking away and pretending we haven't seen someone, are ways to signal our like or dislike of others. We pick up these shared practices as we go along in life, and they help us make our place within our communities. From the Confucian perspective, society will flourish if people are similarly committed to benevolence, ren, and they express this concern for others appropriately in their interactions with others. Some worry that Confucian ritual propriety is unnecessarily binding on individuals and restricts individual autonomy, but Confucian philosophy allows for a broad spectrum of ways in which we incorporate it into our lives. In her published work, 
Karen has suggested that the Analex advocates differing levels of adherence to ritual propriety, which may be due to how it is to be applied at different stages in life. For a learner, greater adherence is required so that they get to know the ropes, so to speak. This is not unlike learning an instrument, where if we are to learn it well, we need to develop a feel for the instrument and the sounds it makes before we are able to improvise to get the sounds we want to make. For those of us who have learned to play a musical instrument well or some other instrument that requires competence, we would have had to develop a feel for it. Learning to play a guitar, for example, involves getting one's fingers on the correct frets to play a chord, knowing what a right G chord sounds like, and when there is an off note. Once you get really good at it, you don't even have to think about where the fingers go to get a G chord. The beginning guitarist constantly looks at the fingerboard and the frets, just as a beginner in Li is constantly asking what the right actions are in a given situation. Furthermore, an accomplished guitarist has not only mastered the feel for the guitar, she might also have a capacity to improvise, as a jazz guitarist would, without having to stop to think about how to strum or pluck, or how to place her fingers on the fingerboard, or even to look at the score. Analogously, a person accomplished in ritual propriety is fluent in practices and is in a position to express their concern for others, their benevolence, without having to think about what the correct forms of behavior are in a particular situation. It's not so much that once a person has developed fluency in Li practices, we can leave those practices behind. It's more that the person doesn't constantly need to think what to do next or in any one situation because they embody Li. Here's another analogy. As beginning cyclists, we have to learn the road rules and think what to do next when we get to a large roundabout. As mature cyclists, we no longer need the manual on road rules. How many experienced cyclists have a copy at home? It's not that we can forget the rules, but that mature cyclists have embodied the rules. They give way or signal before turning without having to remind themselves to do so because the rules have become second nature to them. Likewise, Kong Tzu improvises in his ritual practices. In Analects 9.3, he deliberates on whether he will go along with certain practices, for instance, the replacement of linen with silk for ceremonial caps. Kung Tzu commented that he would follow this modification as silk was more economical. However, he disagreed with another ritual modification regarding the practice of approaching a ritual hall. The traditional practice of bowing prior to ascending the stairs was replaced with bowing after ascending them. Kung Tzu disagreed with this modification on the grounds that it was arrogant. He explicitly acknowledged that he was going against the majority here. This passage shows Kong Tzu actively making decisions about ritual. It deliberately portrays him as going along with popular practice in one case and rejecting it in another. It's also important that he gives reasons for each of these decisions. The first, that silk is more economical, is a pragmatic consideration, while the second concerns reverence embedded in a ritual. Here we catch a glimpse of how a range of reasons, moral and non-moral, bear on Kong Tzu's decisions. But not all of us are like Kong Tzu, fluent in ritual propriety and with his confidence in playing by ear, so to speak. Certainly, the majority of people in his time would not have been deemed capable of doing so. Are they expected simply to fit in with the prevailing behaviors so that society can move along harmoniously? There's some concern that Confucian philosophy endorses a conception of harmony that comes at a cost to an individual's expression of their agency. Philosopher Li Qianyang addresses this question in detail, making the case that Confucian harmony, or He, does not concern alignment with an Archimedean point. Li characterizes this conception of harmony as oppressive, calling it harmony by conformity, Tong. This view of harmony does not correspond with a Confucian view of the cosmos, one which does not presume a fixed, established order. In addition, Li argues, Kong Tzu stated explicitly that cultivated persons, or Jun Tzu, seek harmony but not sameness. Here, Kong Tzu says that the Jun Tzu does desire to be amicable, but without succumbing to pressure to imitate others. In Li's view, this indicates that Kong Tzu was not seeking conformity. He offers a more cogent account of Confucian harmony as a process that does not simplistically seek merely to eliminate conflict. Li proposes that the harmonization of sounds in music and flavors in cooking are paradigmatic examples of Confucian harmony. They provide compelling metaphors for protecting individual interests. After all, without individual sounds, there's no music, and without individual ingredients, there is no dish. We have already come across the Zhou Chuan, an early commentary on the spring and autumn annals. In one of its sections, a duke confides in his advisor, Yan Tzu, 
that only one of the officials, Zhu, is in harmony with him. Yuan Tzu allays the duke's concerns, pointing out that Zhu is merely a yes man. He merely assents to everything the official says. One cannot equate assenting with harmony, says Yuan Tzu. He then illustrates the point by using one of the metaphors we just considered. Harmony is like a stew. Water, fire, meat jerky, mincemeat, salt, and plum vinegar are used to cook fish and meat. These are cooked over firewood. The master chef harmonizes them, evening them out with seasonings, compensating for what is lacking, and diminishing what is too strong. The passage continues by extending the analogy to ruler and subject, who are responsively complementary. When the ruler incorrectly conceives what is right, the subject brings attention to the mistake. When the ruler identifies what is wrong, the subject brings forth what is right to eliminate what is wrong. Such responsiveness in an early Confucian text gives the subject an important role within society, even if only as a sounding board. And the example from cooking stew gives us more food for thought. Let's take one of the ingredients, say the plum vinegar. It brings a sour taste to the stew, balancing with the flavors of the other ingredients. A connoisseur would notice if it was missing, or if rice vinegar had been added instead of plum vinegar. So the vinegar has its place in this stew, but there can be too much or too little of it, just as we sometimes feel we have over-salted our food. When that happens, there's no easy fix. You might try adding more liquid, but that could dilute the other flavors. All of which serves not only to make us hungry, but also to illuminate Lee's proposal that Confucian harmony is a process rather than an endpoint. It also helps exemplify the place of an individual within society. The place of vinegar in the stew illuminates the person's identity and agency in their community. The balancing of flavors with the vinegar as an ingredient prompts us to think about how individuals orient themselves within their context of action. Each person makes their mark or imprint, or many of these, on the life of their community. What Kong Tzu said about 2,500 years ago about agency is still fresh for us. Consider the standard question at job interviews, what do you bring to this position? Just as vinegar is diffused throughout the stew and no longer tastes like a spoonful of vinegar served straight, the identity of an individual is inseparable from the impact that individual makes on society. The difference an individual makes is an expression of their agency. This is why it matters what people think of us at 40. It's helpful feedback on the difference we have been making. On the other hand, as we've seen, yay sayers fail to meet the mark. Kong Tzu says that the cultivated person does not strive merely to be like the others or to be liked by them. In this way, the analects makes room for individuals to position themselves, especially in societies that are corrupt, or ones in which attempts to uphold moral values are constantly being contested. Yet there is a significant difference between Confucian philosophy's understanding of tradition and how we might think of it. It's often said of Confucianism that it is backward-looking. This arises because Kong Tzu referred to the golden age of the past associated with the Duke of Zhou. It also has to do with the centrality of propriety in Confucian thought, which makes it sound old-fashioned. For the Confucians, the tried and tested ways that have worked in the past for a valuable moral resource. They are a repository that we may draw upon when we find ourselves in relevantly similar circumstances. It helps to read about others' successes and failures, and to imagine what we ourselves might do if we found ourselves in the same situation. Would we cover up for our father if he stole something from his neighbor? Would we, like Shun, show devotion to our family even if they tried to assassinate us? You never know, it could happen. The Analects mentioned many ways in which we can learn from praiseworthy and blameworthy behaviors. We may observe others, as Kong Tzu observed Tsai Wu and saw him sleeping during the day. We may read books. Kong Tzu also advocated listening, asking questions, and having discussions with others. Valuable as the repository is, we should not aim merely to familiarize ourselves with it. To be entirely lodged in the repository is to commit oneself to an overall state of inertia and stagnation. As we have seen, Kung Tzu is presented as a person who reflects on whether he should go along with the practices of his day. He also remarked that a person who is a teacher revises the old in order to realize the new. In other words, although tradition has an important place in educating us, we should always consider whether it needs to be adapted for the situation at hand. When we adapt and when we appropriate, we create new paths, and when we exercise our agency in this way, we develop our individual repertoire. That repertoire is, of course, our style. It is our identity. If these novel ways are successful because they embody benevolence, they will become important additions to the shared repository. 
They are how we give back to the tradition that is bigger than us. They make for moral progress. With that, we've come to the end of this mini-series of episodes which has focused on the Analects and in the process introduced you to some of the main themes of Confucianism as a whole. Of course, we're going to move on to further texts from this tradition in coming episodes, especially the Mengzi and Sunzi. You're probably impatient to learn about those texts, but simmer down, because we're going to add one more ingredient to this opening course, an interview with Mark Chitsen Mikai, a true connoisseur of classical Chinese philosophy. Hopefully that will whet your appetite for the next episode of The History of Philosophy in China. <laughs>